Uh, I was telling Emma earlier, before we got together here, that I once had a student, I still know very well, um, who stood up in a seminar discussion, really angry. She's called Yelena Sudakova. And as you guess, she's a Russian. And she said, John, yes. <laughs> Your history of Russian art's different from mine. And um, she's quite right. And I had the sense, as it happened, to say, yes, that's good, isn't it? We should talk about it. And uh, the conversation has been going on in an extraordinary way ever since. She's now a director of something called Crowd Gallery in London, in um, Little Portland Street, which is quite near the BBC's Broadcasting House building, which it stands for, is the name of a missile, of course, but it stands for Gallery for Russian Art and Design. And she runs it wonderfully well. So um, that discussion is, in a sense, still going on and turning into all kinds of things. But she was right. We do have different histories of Russian art. And it's because of the Cold War. It's because of different ideologies. It's because, ultimately, the Orthodox Church separated from the Catholic Church you know, to give us Orthodox and <laughs> division of um, religions and so on. It's a very long-lasting uh, war which became the Iron Curtain. And it's still negotiated, really, on a daily basis. So the Russians think of their art quite differently from the way we do. One of my interests has been to try to sort this out a bit. How do you, how do, you do this? If I hesitate to ask this audience, but if I ask you about what you know about Vrubel, would anyone be able to say anything? We call Vrubel. Every Russian would be able to tell it. So there's a mystery game, you see? We're not talking to each other. Vrubel was one of the great uh, um, painters of the end of the 19th century. Did all kinds of amazing and wonderful things. Anyway, I don't want to go into that at the moment. I want to begin with the story of two Davids, really, to get us going. This one died recently, a few months ago. He's, I always thought he was the nicest anarchist you could wish to meet. You know, famously, anarchists have tea parties. They don't all go around with, um, with bombs fizzing in their pocket. Uh, but David King, this is the man we're looking at here, was the most astonishing person. And he is a real driving force in uh, the interest, really, a source for the interest that people have developed in Russian art. He loved Russia and he hated it in equal measure. Um, I asked him once how he got involved with Russian art, and he said, well, he studied graphic design at uh, St. Martin's School of Art, as it then was. And they're all going on about the bloody Bauhaus, he said. <laughs> I said, so? He said, the only thing that interests me about graphic art is the politics. That's a very odd thing to say, isn't it, really? But I think by the end of this talk, you'll figure out what he was, what he was going on about. A most amazing man, because he, he studied graphic art. He was an active designer of posters, books, and, and so on. He um, was instrumental in putting the first Sunday Times color supplements together. And they sent him to Moscow as a kind of um, photojournalist also. So already you have the Russian element, the photography, the designer, the politics, all coming together. And it's been a feature of uh, David's life that he, has do he developed a colossal collection. There was one bed in his house, which was on the top of a bookshelf. <laughs> never to get into the bed. And I couldn't help thinking that he had been stuffing stuff under the bed for years and years. His house in St. Paul's Road in um, Islington, really, I suppose, no, Highbury, was full, absolutely full. He had large albums on which, on the inside page, he said, this book belongs to Joseph Stalin. All kinds of amazing <laughs> material of this kind. He hated Stalin with a great loathing. And he had Stalin um, lampshades. He had all kinds of material about Stalin. He became an expert on people who were missing. He knew who wasn't there on the, on the May Day Parade in Red Square. He knew who wasn't on the mausoleum. He could say, oh, so-and-so's gone. Um, he wrote a very famous book called The Commissar Vanishes, which was about um, doctoring, editing photographs, in that particular case, to remove Trotsky from an image. 
because he was an army person. And he had a whole collection of photographs of people who had been scrapped out. It was enough, apparently, at a certain point, if your, if your father, your uncle, your husband was disapproved of, you could keep the photo and you could keep the frame, but you had to scrub his face out, you know, this kind of thing. It proved that you'd done it, in a way. So, in this terrifying world, this photo journalist was um, a godsend. And he began to collect things he shouldn't have. So he had over 10,000 photographs of Trotsky by the time he died. He did a good book about Trotsky. He said it was easy to get them because people weren't supposed to have them. So they very <laughs> happily handed over um, the photograph for a bit of cash. So the graphic art enabled him to produce books. All of his books were designed by him from the works in his collection. Say he was the writer, his floor would be covered in all the pages, meticulously crystallizing how a book would go together. And some of them were really frightening. A lot of them have photographs, but there's a lot of uh, graphic work in there also. So this is a little tribute to David, who you see here. Uh, he was completely without any kind of pompous attitude, and he was ruthlessly <laughs> Um, accurate in summing up your own political views, and I know oh, you're rubbish, you're doing rubbish, you know, and that kind of thing. He was nearly arrested once, and he had a poster banned. He designed a poster on the minor side of the minor strike, and he had a figure going with a sickle taking off Mrs. Hatcher's head. So he did have a frightening side to him, but he loved the frightening world that he was observing in uh, in, in Russia. Um, so, he became a very famous source for a lot of people, and he did one of the most frightening books I've ever come across, Ordinary Citizens. Have any of you seen this? It's now a bit scarce, but they will have you to the take bookshop in place of time. She's about to be shot the next day. He gained access as when communism collapsed. He managed to gain access to some KGB files which had you know, several thousand images of people who were shot the next day. Um, it's a kind of constructivist project from his point of view because, like the constructivists, he thought photography was facts. Mm -hmm. Several Russian constructivists argued that photography is a fact about the world. It shows you something factual, rather than many other ways of being about photography. And these people were facts. The format is the same on every page. It's a different person. And they're terrifying. Some of them look as calm as could be. Some look horrified. Some are rather injured Chinese people, you know. And um, there were thousands of these photographs. And David said that it was very chilling choosing which people to put in the book because it was like deciding which ones were going to be remembered. And he described the book as um, a memorial. And he, he worked with this organization called Memorial, which uh, collects all this material now. And he thought it was a memorial because if it was published, it couldn't be withdrawn. So here's the love-hate relationship, you see. The photographs look so dramatic, not because this young woman is terrified, although it is dramatic for that awful reason, but because the KGB, or whatever they're called at the time, saved flash bulbs by having a brightly lit window light from one side. So you were marched through, photographed, and, uh, and, sh and shot shortly afterwards. Um, some of, most of those people are completely um, ordinary people. Some of them were editors of constructivist magazines. Some, like uh, Michael, was a great um, theatre director who was devoted to the communist cause from 1917 onwards. Um, his wife had her eyes removed before he was shot. <laughs> it's uh, terrifying and horrific. And uh, oh yes, he was shot. You can't quite read it here. He was shot for anti-Soviet Trotsky's tendencies. Uh, and uh, that was the end of him. But the photographs are gripping, and another David King sort of constructed this element is they're all anonymous. The, we don't know who the photographers were, they're just some um, apparatchiks and soldiers. So uh, David has developed 
uh, it's made evident a great deal that's good and bad about the Soviet system. But he became completely obsessed with it, and uh, he had a great collection which he gave, uh, sold it, and he gave it to somebody to uh, take to the take care of. So that they're still sifting through all the material at the moment. This is the other David that he has celebrated here. This is David Elliott, who worked quite closely with David King on some of his projects, including Rutching and Show. If you look at the, the display cabinet upstairs, you will see uh, his, David King's poster for it. And uh, the catalogue also is um, a kind of dynamic, constructivist um, catalogue that came out of the collaboration. David was, this David was younger at that time. But uh, you see here quite a different and interesting personality. David Elliott was unstoppable. Uh, he wasn't seeking the most awful things in the world to show you. He was simply, and still is, unstoppable, isn't he? From one place to another place to another place. And he had a long string of Biennale directorships that I know about, and some of those were Russian. He became very interested in. Uh, in the Russian avant-garde and in um, a lot of different aspects of it. And of course, he was a very important figure in this, um, in this gallery. I knew uh, David because I just, uh, we were both interested in Russian things. And uh, he's, this is in late Soviet days when people were still marching up and down in long lines with red flags and uh, you know, shouting glory to Lenin and all the rest. And David managed to contact uh, Alexander Lavretia, the grandson of Rochinka, and um, who has still the Rochinka Stepanova archive in Moscow, uh, which is still an apartment in the art school where Rochinka had uh, taught and lived in the 1920s. Very strange place because the grandson is completely surrounded by his grandfather's material. And his mother was called confusingly Varvara Rutschenka, the daughter of the two parents. And uh, she's still a library ancient photographer and book designer. And uh, Alexander Lavrentev teaches at the Stravinov Academy in Moscow. And he's immensely helpful. I never quite figured out how he managed to keep ownership of all his materials. But it is, um, it's a huge archive that's finally begun to be used for uh, an immense number of photographs and posters and everything else squashed into this apartment. And he, is, he never charges any reproduction fee or copyright fee for works by Rochinka. It's just something he says it could be better way of promoting them than the slightly communist uh, thing still, I think. And he gives paintings to museums, so they're very valuable, something we might talk about. Uh, he gives them to museum. Anyway, David got involved with him, and uh, they became part of a very valuable um, relationship. One effect this had was, I think, on one occasion, David had got a whole lot of paintings of, as far as the airport in crates, and they wouldn't let him put them on the, on the plane. There's some piece of paper missing. <laughs> I have all people. There's a message from him. I don't, I don't Tom Hackett, Tommy Dillard, I have Bob Moscow, and I've got all these crates, and uh, will you ring somebody at Oxford so and get them to ring back and vouch that I'm a reliable, decent person? <laughs> this is, uh, a former tutor was contacted, and um, he said, oh, that's all right, yes, good, and uh, off, off, you know, the paintings came. Absolutely unstoppable, and uh, very charming, and, uh, and not always, um, very polite. He, was, he worked so very, very hard that uh, he really liked things to work. This, I was looking in the archive here the other day, and I decided I couldn't show you a slide of this letter because I hadn't asked him, and uh, only it had names of it and so on. Anyway, this is a difficult letter to somebody who isn't producing the goods for the catalog. Time is ticking. No good having the catalogue after the show. You know, you can imagine the tensions building up. So he said, Dear X, no doubt the whole matter is a pain in the neck to you, but rest assured it's a worse, bigger pain in my neck. <laughs> Are you doing something? 
Not sincerely there. So. <laughs> and you can see it. It's not stoppable. Um, such an appetite. He did a great exhibition of East German painting before the wall came down. You know, remarkable. Not just not seen in the West. Now, one thing we might talk about later is were these two uh, taking a political position? Or was this just life happening to them in a particular way? Were they trying to persuade us of, of something? Is that what I did today? Here are some glimpses of some things that I was involved in that got involved with uh, in David's uh, exhibition. These are hanging pieces originally designed by uh, Rodchenko with students at this uh, higher artistic technical studio's place, the sort of Moscow Bauhaus, if you like, or Fukuyemas. And they were designed to be completely um, anonymous, uh, to have no value, to be purely uh, geometric, to have no self-expression built into them. And it was one of uh, Rodchenko's most determined beliefs from very early in his career that he would like to kill what he called French cookery, that is good taste, tasteful adjustments of colour and so on. He would, get, <coughs> he would kill art of that kind. And of course, when the revolution came along, it was much easier to talk about killing art than you might expect, because the currency had collapsed. A lot of wealthy collectors and emigres had run away immediately. Um, there were no commercial galleries. The, um, there were no private commissions. Um, <laughs> what is an artist to do? Um, and uh, it was very, very difficult. And um, everything was owned by everyone. No one owned anything individually in the first years, in theory, at least, and very substantial in practice. So ownership of luxury goods for wealthy patrons, no. Wasn't that? just got more or less overnight. And um, this explains a little bit why such a radical investigation of visual creativity could take place. Uh, a lot of it was done on paper, a lot of it was um, um, trying to survive uh, or trying to think out a new kind of culture. The, the Soviet government was the only source of money, not the only source of money really was the Commissar for Education and Culture, currently called the Commissar, Commissariat of the Enlightenment, uh, Anatoly Lunacharsky, who was quite broad-minded in which groups of artists he supported with money. And this went on until about 26, 27. He refused to take sides on the grounds that it all shake down and then we'll find out what proletarian workers' art looks like. It was no good having a good education. That was no help at all if you were part of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It would be positively dangerous. So there was a lot of radical experiment, and um, keeping geometric was one way of keeping your name off things. Rodchenko also kicked some of these things in lectures to prove that they had no commercial value. Now, in the communist society at the time, they probably didn't have any commercial value. But of course, that's not so anymore, ever since um, uh, Southway's got onto this kind of thing. This picture of Rajan on the wall there, uh, with some of his elements in the background. Uh, this is another. These are reconstructions. Um, would you like to open that mystery box at your feet? Some of them are nonetheless very, very beautiful and intriguing things. And these. Um, that am I getting out are small reproductions of them, but done um, in collaboration with uh, Alexander Lavrentiev, uh, the, the grandson. And Rodchenko apparently wanted these things to be made of something very shiny, like steel. And these little ones, we, we did some big ones recently, but these little ones um, are each from a single sheet of steel, stainless steel, twisted. So there's nothing else holding them together, really. We could put them flat. And they wouldn't break until you've done it quite a few times. But they cast beautiful shadows, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's another one. I could have one. 
you can have a look at these later, they're fairly marginally fragile. This one doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah, that's the one. Yes. You see, it, it gets to be a bit hypnotic. Mm -hmm. Well, beautiful. It's like someone asked me, where do you put the parrot in this cage? Where do you put <laughs> But of course, it's like two um, spirals going around each other. So geometry seemed to him to be one way forward, Rothschenko. Now, here's a spooky photograph. This is uh, by a um, photogenic friend, Georgi Petrusov, portrait of Rothschenko, with his thick neck and uh, rubbery ears, but also looking back at him. You know, this double exposure, as if you can't trust him, <laughs> as if he's watching, or as if he's saying something else to, uh, to his minders, and it's rather a brilliant image of the time. It's the first sign we'll see, we shall see, of Rodchenko having to accommodate to political change in, in the Soviet um, system. That was 1933. This is 1932, when a huge exhibition was put on in Leningrad at the Russian Museum. Uh, for 15 years' work, it was called. It was, uh, it was over 3,000 works, a colossal exhibition. And uh, it was a very wide display of things. Um, effectively, a bit like Pick and Mix and Woolworths. It enabled the, uh, the commissars to decide what um, Soviet culture was going to be. And um, here you see, you see um, socialist realist portraits of Lenin going up. Uh, but here, that's amazing, this man is Kazimir Malevich, who did the famous black square geometric abstract designs. And he's hanging these other things. He was given a room of his own at this uh, exhibition, and he's um, He's actually in a very delicate position at this point because he's been, um, he's been arrested twice for going west with some of his works and he, was, he underwent a kind of water torture treatment. But here he is being recognized but clearly behaving himself rather carefully. So what am I trying to say in this introduction? You cannot understand this at all thoroughly if you don't take on board the ideological restraints and financial restraints, because the state is the only patron. Simple as that. It's the only patron. And there isn't another one. Uh, all exhibitions were initially called State Exhibition Number One, State Exhibition Number Two, and so on. They were very big shows and very adventurous, some of them. So these people had to learn to survive. And one immediate effect of artists joining, a lot of avant-garde artists joined very willingly with the uh, October Revolution, uh, was the decoration of the city with um, all kinds of um, celebratory um, murals, um, paintings hanging on the outsides of buildings, and so on. This is perhaps Rodchenko's first step in that direction. This is really like a lot of his other early-ish um, uh, geometric paintings. He said in Silentio that he used the ruler, the um, compass, and later the camera, because they left no sign of his own personal touch. Anyway, the intriguing thing for this, for me here, is there is a sense of construction and maybe this astronomical events or something, but it also happens to spell out R F S R in the Russian Federation. So, um, it's got a political dimension. Um, Rodchenko was very soon trying to kill off painting. And uh, it's a very strange thing for a painter to attempt to do. Uh, but he felt that he'd have no purpose anymore. And the idea of um, construction as a um, means of being creative was a neutral word that was adopted by all sorts of people. Your um, electrician can construct a second, you know, um, people can construct a new kind of shed or something. Everyone can be a constructor, they don't need to be painters or sculptors. And um, so painting, especially as no one was buying it, 
got to be a problematic concept. Um, as I say, luxury goods for wealthy people of the old regime. So how to get through this kind of system is quite a question. So one thing Rodchenko did, inspired by Taki really, was propaganda kiosks, or lots of designs for them. Uh, often with rather cryptic and puzzling messages, uh, the future is our only aim. <laughs> this would make sense. The future is our only aim. We're going there anyway, but it would be of course. And uh, this is um, a design for a propaganda kiosk uh, to stand in the street with these anonymous puppet-like uh, figures. Um, attending to learn about what's happening in the Soviet view of the world, but notice that the whole thing is like a figure with a top for a head and a uh, top half and legs and it even has feet. So this idea of an anonymous robotic social human is built into this message of communism. Now I want to very briefly look at some puzzling phenomena here. Once you've taken the step of removing the special status of the artist, then everyone could be creative. If it's just construction, they may be no good at it. Kathleen wrote a little essay called The One of the Creative Person in the Collective, <laughs> showing how difficult it would be. But the idea that engineers construct excited a lot of attention. This is rather a wonderful radio tower, which still exists in Moscow, uh, although people keep stealing some of the lower pieces of it. There's a model in the Science Museum. Uh, this is a photograph. It's by a man called uh, Shukhov, Vladimir Shukhov. And um, it, it stands up. It has no spinal bit. It is, uh, each of these sections is um, independent. And they go like this. And the next one was pulled up each time to it, so it appears some people to be growing like some Martian plant. Uh, so this is the Shabalovska Tower in Moscow, and it's a radio tower, and that's a photograph of it. Um, this is Rodchenko photograph of it uh, from 1929. So we've got an interreaction here between the artist's eye and the designer and the engineer and the photographer. And you can see this is quite like some of Rodchenko's paintings, but now they're in photography. So he's very keen to move from art materials to the mechanical view of the photographic eye. Now, what I, one question I want to ask you here is if we look at Shukhov's tower, he was an engineer, and we look at Tatlin's tower, famous one of the inventors of constructivist thinking, is this an engine? Could you model it? Is this engineering? It's a model. It was never made bigger than this. What do you thought? Does the light look too merged together? Um, yes, you think it might collapse? Like with the, no, well, no. But with the, but with the bones of the, um, the images, so there's, there's no image, it seems like the merge of the two. Yes, that's true. Ones. Isn't it? Yes. No, that's spiral, very, very the interesting. The spiral and the um, construction yes. of like, the sort of almost like an Eiffel Tower construction, but yes. with a spiral going through it and around. Two spirals. Um, this is Tatlin's monument the model of the monument of the Third International, which was to step over the river Neva uh, from near the um, Hermitage. And this piece of paper is the river. It's Tatlin down there. And there was a little boy who turned the handle to make these rooms go around. It was to be the communist international, or put it in plain English, the, the, um, the, the citadel of the government of the world, of planet Earth. And he, he was arguing that planet Earth is what it's screwing out of. And it would resolve all the historical tribulations of mankind and all mankind. Uh, by this revolving. It also follows, in fact, as ships were going in the air, that you could sink the whole of if you were careful by uh, letting it collapse. Anyway, it's a wonderful thing uh, in itself, and it was to project um, the news and um, slogans onto the clouds. It was to be immense. Shukovs was much closer to straight engineering, but was pretty tall. This is only a model. 
So it was quite interesting to see that his Tatlin was trained as a painter, and uh, he's doing something that looks like engineering. So we're entering a little, um, sorry, I'm talking too long here, um, a little moment of consideration of whether Roger here in his suit he designed himself to look busy or work. <laughs> is he pretending to be a worker? Or is he really rather a designer? So it may be that some of these artists, in a sense, were intellectuals, wanted to be workers. They were all constructors together. Here's a worker, surely. This, too, is clearly a posed photograph, um, <laughs> again by the Shekhet man, who shows this relationship between the physical worker hero and machinery that's extending his power. Well, it's quite a peculiar comparison, isn't it? Uh, what about this? This is uh, Tatlin and his little collective working on the model of the monument that we saw a moment ago. It's very fascinating. This a high resolution image. It doesn't appear. But if you look at the original, it's a vast shoe, bark, bark shoes. <laughs> you know, all kinds of bits of signs of the times. And uh, she's cutting a piece of glass. And this is Tatlin looking about 16 or so, which is a good deal older than that. And here he goes, he does little metal clips holding it together. Is that a worker at work? What do you think? It's um, kind of different activity, isn't it? Who's going to get hotter of these two? <laughs> That's physical labor. This is intellectual, I think. So artists who'd had artistic education really needed to prove they were workers, we put it that way. This is uh, Lisitsky, constructor, of course, um, self-portrait with a circle of a photo montage, montage in the negative. He's putting himself over as a kind of professional architect almost, I think, yeah. But let me press on rather rapidly. Uh, Rochek has started a scheme to destroy painting by doing less and less expressive paintings. Uh, paintings which have no closed forms in them, like this, this painting, which suggests surface and movement, uh, very comparable with his um, hanging pieces, like the one you've just been looking at. He did do a painting called The Last Paintings, more of you will know. Uh, three panels, red, blue, and yellow, and each of them blank or monochrome. Um, and he called it the last painting. That was painting out painting, after which you'd have to do something else. Well, some of those constructions uh, were part of his answer. Uh, but he did admit, uh, almost at once, that uh, although they were very intriguing, he couldn't think of any useful purpose for them. And what were they for was a question that had him baffled. This man, Asip Brik, you see the AR signature in the corner, um, ran, um, he became a very important theorist of all this kind of stuff. <coughs> He's got the F in his eye here, because that was a magazine of which he was one of the editors. And, and Rodchenko wrote for the magazine. Um, Asip Brik wrote very lively essays saying, for example, what's the difference between a painting and a boot? <laughs> Very good question. You might think about it, but uh, what's the difference between a painting and a boot? And the answer is, you could wear the boot. <laughs> Very hard-headed man who, who wanted to reform the, the Russian language into a new Soviet kind of speaking too. And um, quite a remarkable person, but that's a Rodchenko photo. And he was just as um, concerned to look at the person as an object in his photographs as any of the other things he was looking at. It dawned on him, <coughs> partly due to a big debate about whether composition or construction are different, uh, that he was a constructive person. And that meant no more um, asymmetry, because it leads you straight into composing something as much straightforward, factual evidence, symmetrically produced, <laughs> not by hand, as he could put together. And you get these brutal images. This is uh, the great revolutionary poet uh, Vladimir Mayakovsky. 
and he moved into many kinds of design as if it was his inheritance. Now he's not got to be a painter anymore, he can construct anything. This is a famous book cover about this, or about that is another way of translating it, Proeta by Mayakovsky. This is Lydia Brick, who is the wife of Ossip Brick, who, came home again, who had a kind of triangular relationship with Mayakovsky. He produced this book, which was illustrated with a photo montage of real people having this affair. <laughs> so it was a real story about real people in a tango, really, and uh, asking Rodchenko to design it. She became a very famous uh, figure. So you can see there were some extraordinary experiments going on in the, in the 20s. And of course, this was all in the Lenin period. When Lenin died in 1924, they then had a great myth-making episode beginning. These are designs by Strusiev, who was a celebrated uh, architect before the revolution, but for Lenin's mausoleum, an enigma. A mausoleum, a tomb, for someone who was atheist, you know, it's, um, whose ideology was strictly anti-religion. They tried to make it look like some kind of uh, a Syrian ziggurat. Uh, those who have been there, you know, it's actually a rather handsome building, uh, but it's, it had a kind of stripped down classical format from the beginning. You can see it used to have a little space for a tribune to uh, transmit messages. So Lenin was dead, and Stalin, who steadily took over, used the myth of Lenin like Lenin never had done. So most of the paintings of Lenin are from the Stalin period. And uh, rather like Catherine the Great used um, Peter the Great as an image to, to substantiate her power back. Here is a photograph of the Soviet pavilion at the Paris International Exposition of Decorative and Industrial Arts, which was uh, designed by Michael Mielenkov, but decorated by Rodchenko, uh, who painted most of it red, so that people would look redder when they went into it. <laughs> A kind of propaganda kiosk. You see this bit of the workers' reading room, with Rodchenko chairs and so on, um, has a little this memorial display about her Lenin dying in the background there. So it's a great slogan that Lenin lived, Lenin died, Lenin lives. And uh, this adopting of religious imagery, uh, adopting it in most extraordinary ways, was a powerful way of erasing Christianity, but using the dates in the calendar in a whole new way. For example, a, there was an icon painting workshop that continued through the revolution in a place called Palais. And the idea was that these chaps were going to starve. They, they could do little paintings, I can like paintings, but they would have Lenin in them instead of Jesus and so on. So um, I saw one of these which had Lenin rising to heaven. Um, <laughs> and the angels receiving him, archangels I suppose, had six wings, except they were red flags. You know, <laughs> otherwise it looked exactly the same. Uh, Rodchenko in the 1920s, took on um, a sort of photographic reportage of the city life of uh, Moscow. They're very splendid, some of these uh, photographs. He thought they were impersonal, they were just the life of the city. And increasingly from this point, uh, images of people in his, in his works are anonymous. It's as if the collective is what he's depicting. Here's a, a sort of glorious image of uh, Lenin pointing out that uh, electrification is now underway and it's going to give power to the whole of the uh, system. Um, and uh, here is uh, a lot of imagery was picked up in that way. So it seems would come down from the government. And they appear in films, in books, in paintings, and, and so on. So here is an electricity pylon photographed by Rodchenko like some great a bit like the Tatian Tower, some great mechanical human. Now, we've seen Rodchenko move from being a painter to a constructor, a designer, a photographer, as a way of getting out of art altogether, really, 
doing something a bit different. It was argued amongst constructivist theorists that um, the ultimate material with which creative people should work is the social mass of people. Can you imagine? So in the first phase on the Lenin, there was a kind of dictum that art should be collectively produced. Artists should be squeezed out of their studio. It should be produced collectively, not just one person scratching his head thinking, where is the real me? That kind of thing. I have to be alert to the political demands. And thirdly, it had to be public in its expansion. So something like theatre and something much more able to achieve this. When Stalin began to get a grip, um, he not only permitted Lenin, but changed the whole system, of course. He had a different triad of requirements. The first was Narod, the, the, the people, the people as a country, you know? Narod. And then um, this next, Idienus, you had to get your ideology right. And then Partinus, which meant you had to tell the party line. So Narod meant really in so many words, it meant communism in one country. And do as you talk, or do as the party tells you, and get your ideology right. So you couldn't just launch into some new artwork. Now what proved terrifically important in this field is photography. Now we've seen ways in which reasons in way, or you can in a few minutes, why Russian I talk about photography. Who's a painter? After all, he learned photography from photojournalists, from the trained photojournalists. And um, the one, one wonderful feature of photography, as well as this poor slide, it's a wonderful photograph, is that it's convincing. It meant that Rutschenk and others could depict people again, instead of just circles and squares and lines, but not, didn't have to paint them or touch them or anything. They were just uh, images on a piece of paper. And they were completely, they could be completely convincing because people could read them so easily. None of this fancy pants geometric art to deal with. So here's a case. This is a little known uh, photographer called Bob Roth. Two peasant women hugging. Now it makes you smile if you like well, this is such an extraordinary image that you can believe they really love digging that road. <laughs> <laughs> Life's great if you're digging a road. Look at them. They're lovely. And it's so persuasive, you see. I could never be that persuasive painting. So here, uh, we move into this uh, Stalin face, very, very briefly, because I'm talking much too much. The pioneer. Children became pioneers, if you're really good at it at all. And they used the word we. You were never allowed to say, I want an ice cream. You know, we are doing this or that. And they managed to achieve a kind of um, collective identity, which means that even when you look at a Rutschenko photo of a pioneer like this, you don't know who he is or anything. So it has this sense of anonymity, of part of a collective, of a militarized group, of um, a sort of type. Not individuals, but types of people. Uh, here's Dienyaka, Alexander Dienyaka, who became very celebrated socialist realist person from the mid-twenties onwards. Uh, socialist realism was launched more or less officially in 1932, time of the speaker of Manager. And this is, sorry, it's a, a very expensive a very enlarged slide. But this is called Lunchtime on the Donbass. They've been working in the line. And you can see, I think, pretty clearly that there are a group. They're determined, they're defined by their work. They're properly put together from photographic photomontage imagery, which is then turned back into painting. So this photographic impact was very profound. And people liked it. They could understand it. If you knew nothing about art, you think, oh, yes, they had a good time, those guys. And um, the mass could be manipulated into geometry, like Rodchenko's painting. Rodchenko photograph here of athletes parading past uh, Lenin's mausoleum and so on. Just like something out of Manjevich and down. Farm workers, 
athletes, um, all kinds of groups of people were depicted as faceless, anonymous. Um, there are a number of novels that we should read at the time about the strange psychological transformation of only being part of the group. And I think here we see these uh, sportsmen by Malevich, and I think he's some um, right writes about whether it's a good idea or not. But um, there they are. These are sport. In sport, sport has no religion, really. Sport can replace religion with Skydive. You can be a perfect human being in your musculature. You're just a physical creature. Any other religious or intellectual ideas or emotions are just electric currents in your brain. It's intriguing to see how close this gets to contemporary <laughs> sports care. Um, Stalin loves these great parades, great engineering projects, um, colossal reversing of the flow of some rivers, uh, immense uh, aeronautic inventions. This is the Maxim Gorky aeroplane, which was the biggest plane ever built at the time. And here you see it passing over uh, what appears at first to be a group of people, but these are actually flags with images of Lenin on them. So you're in a strange and different world that is the kind that would have fascinated uh, David King and uh, Elliot. On the other hand, a sporting dimension of uh, flight was this amazing creature uh, made of bent wood and uh, all kinds of things by Vladimir Tatlin you become more and more interested in <coughs> natural constructions. It was to be the people's bicycle. It was to be reproduced enormously to take the workers to work. Well, I'm nearly finished. We're approaching the state of 1932 when there was change. Even Madhavich had been painting squares and dots and uh, some for years. Uh, this is fucking for a particular reason. At this exhibition of his, his room in the 1932 exhibition, designed a monument which was to be colossal. This is just the top bit of one of his paintings behind it. It said, The man of the future is taking over the cosmos. It must be quite impressive to see. We're recreating the display in the show of the Royal Academy. Got all the paintings except one man named me. One reason why Malevich a bit more practical suddenly, was, as I say, being knocked about in jail, and he didn't want it to happen again, and he was really competing with uh, architects and others to do um, the Palace of the Soviets, which is uh, by Michael Fomini, the biggest building in the world, which had a colossal sculpture of Lenin on the top of it. Advertised and advertised and advertised for years and years, never built. As you probably know, in the end, the foundations, when they knocked down the great cathedral in Moscow to build it, and the foundations they turned into the world's biggest heated swimming pool. And more recently, as the cathedral has gone back up again, not without complaints for some of the uh, workers. Um, Rodchenko is playing the party line on these last uh, couple of photographs. These are sports parades, completely politicized and uh, anonymous people. And he produced um, amazing books, albums for Stalin about the Red Army, about Uzbekistan, uh, working on them with his wife, uh, Barbara Stefanova. It spreads like this, in which crowds become just textures. It's quite unnerving, that how sailors, army, tanks, aeroplanes, Fascinating, but uh, nothing like anything really going on in the West. Maybe the Nazis had something but like it. Well, to finish, um, two histories. Yes, well, the Russian avant-garde became very, very famous in the West. And that made what paintings came out very, very valuable. And they might have had no value at all in the Soviet system. And um, this led to a kind of mismatch which gave way really in the last days of the communist empire when, for example, Subway's opened an office in Moscow for Moscow conceptualists and other contemporary Russian artists to um, 
to sell their work. And many of those Russian artists thought, I'm not selling my work. I don't want to sell my work. I've just done it. You know, we start doing that, we'll be competing with each other. And communism this lasted just long enough to take over your life completely. And there is a very good film that's made about some of this in Moscow now. Very important. See, different artists um, responded to it. And in fact, uh, ironically, it was the yes, that some of them made a great deal of money. Now, one thing I want to say, just for a finish, is that uh, a number of these constructivists left advice to the fact that they're only building prototypes or making prototypes, and they want other people to see this through. The Siski said this quite explicitly in an essay. And uh, working with my son Henry, who is an architectural model maker, we made some of the images which only exist in his drawings. They're in modern materials, so they can't be mistaken for fakes. And um, this is a wonderful thing, it's called the new person, in a lithograph by Lysitsky. But it's very fascinating making these things. This is perspex and aluminium and steel. Because, you know, we had something like 12 fixing plants, because it's quite hard off the floor, this thing. Uh, it didn't look too. I thought it might fold out like scissors or something. And it gave the strange feeling that maybe he had done it, you know? <laughs> um, so that's interesting to pursue things that way. But we were thinking it'd be nice to have an exhibition of Russian architecture in the 20s, um, the best that was never built, you know, the designs that came second by a famous architect. Um, this is um, the new person. Um, and it should have been, just means a person in Russian. It's not a new man as such, new person, neutral, um, male and female, or neither. And uh, it's terrifically dynamic if you follow through his design. Uh, the recent, well, still active, um, contemporary Russian artist, Yuda Kamakov, uh, was uh, brought up in the Soviet system and uh, loved it in some ways and hated it in others. And he put together an exhibition at Einholm with Lysitsky versus Kavokov. Lysitsky is this bright, young, convinced communist um, traveling and spreading the word, um, but maybe he doesn't quite believe it. <laughs> maybe he's trying to do everything. Against Kavokov, who was brought up to believe all this stuff, and uh, then learned to despise it. But maybe this is the camaraderie. You know, it was a very interesting show. This is a new man who's failed to get over the very more but this is Kavakov's uh, And Kavakov did this wonderful, uh, ironic work, you may know it, as a man who flew into space from his room. God, God, see it anymore. But he's surrounded by propaganda, everything the Soviet Union says it could do. And um, it's a marvelous, ironic celebration. And there was a lot of that at the end of the communist period and after. So, for instance, here's a man called uh, Ava, uh, what is he called now? Um, Avakun, uh, who does these extraordinary constructions, which are a mixture of famous Soviet monuments. This is both Tatlin's Tower and the worker and collective farm worker, female worker for industry and agriculture from the Paris exhibition of 1937. But they've got together somehow. Fascinating. They're sort of lost. As Kabakov has a phrase, he says, all that glorious futures are behind us. <laughs> they never existed, probably. The excitement of pursuing some of these themes, I think I just put this on to give you a glimpse of um, what happens if you start to pursue some of these themes. I mean, this is you know, two hours into a, a study for a reconstruction of the time traveler designed by uh, the system. It's all you know, it's a fantastic thing, but you let it loose. Um, you've been listening for longer than I should have let you listen, today, but. Um, that's that. We could talk about things if you wish, if you still have the vitality and energy. What do you think? We've got
Yes. I'm interested in making parallels between um, contemporary artists working today and Lachenko and his contemporaries, and thinking about his restrictions to make art. So you know, it's interesting. Artists always have these kind of restrictions, or want to have these restrictions, and have these restrictions based on them. One of which is that his only patron is the Soviet government. And so interestingly, today, it feels like contemporary artists, their only patron is a uh, sort of capitalist mm. kind of elite group. Um, and so there are, yeah, that is a comparison that has restrictions, but also that the work is kind of a little bit, can be one of two things, it seems like, where the hand of the artist is completely out of work, so that it's kind of this immaterial labour that we are buying, this sort of performative work, and I'm thinking of Lachenko's performative photographs of people, you know, looking like they are making, that they are doing. Um, so there's that kind of comparison. But then there's always this obsession with the hand of the artist and, you know, painting that you can see that the artist has touched that. So there's this weird kind of split there. So it's this kind of, we're still kind of making work for a particular government or particular ideology, in fact. Um, so I don't know, I'm just making those comparisons and also it's all, Yes, I think it's always easy to see somebody else's ideology operating. Yeah. I think Popmark was an amazing revelation in the West, because suddenly you can see all the energy and money and skill that went into promoting advertising. You know, and something a bit like that happened with uh, with uh, propaganda, but you can you can see it if you're not living there. Yeah. <laughs> it's much harder to see. Well, we've, we've had some surprises lately in you know, discovery that the ideologists had a hiccup in the last week and a half, yeah. and um, it's it's very intriguing to see if you can unpick the ideology amongst which you live. I think. And, uh, one of the recurrent themes of a lot of 20th century art has been some kind of international ambition. It's very tricky. I mean, you know, how many mm, museums of modern art are there on the north coast of Africa? You know. <laughs> we think it's world-sized or international, but um, China and Japan are very good. Um, uh, so it's hard to see the ideology you live in. And after um, it's like looking at people's clothes in old wedding photographs, you know, you learned an awful lot about them that you didn't see at the time, just because of the distance in time or in, uh, in space. But um, it is well worth thinking about quite a lot. I mean, one thing that happened when um, Sotheby's opened, Sotheby's opened, uh, well, busts of Lenin started having a value suddenly because they weren't making any more. Because <laughs> of funny things like this. But those artists, contemporary and older, um, suddenly began to have a value, a commercial value that they hadn't had. And there were really quite bitter and randoms about this because I remember one of the uh, artists uh, sold some painting um, and uh, he was shocked to discover that the person who bought it was a dealer who then sold it off for ten times so as well. Somewhere else, and they were completely innocent with all of this. And uh, they couldn't, you know, in, in the 60s it was quite difficult to show work that hadn't been approved of. The famous ball days or exhibition, you know, things being ball days. And, um, and it was um, a kind of network of artist studios that stood in for galleries and they would criticize each other's work vigorously, you know, so like a bunch of intellectuals or philosophers or something come across with some one of them. And they didn't want to have some of this um, paying them money, except they said of course they discovered that yes it would actually you could buy things with money. <laughs> so, um, so then the ideology changed there, and the value of all the paintings changed. And I think that one thing that got people of my generation interested in Russian propaganda was that dealers, some of them quite rascally dealers, started going to Moscow and buying gouaches which they stole, or they bought very, very cheap, and brought back you know, one classic way of doing this was to, um, in late Soviet times, send a parcel 
brought had taken to the post office and they wrapped it, stamped it, saying, look at that or something. So uh, what some people did was they used to get large old art books with stuck in them in illustrations. They'd take those up, put the gouache in, you know, or Russian Cooper or whoever, and then take it to the post office where the woman knew nothing at all about these things for them, and post it to a friend. So you couldn't be traced anyway. Um, but these things then, uh, a great demand arose. I think one of the most honest of these people was Andy Judah, who uh, had a, a gallery in uh, of Tottenham Court Road, and David Judah as his son. Um, she was terrifically good at promoting things, but I think it was the commercial push on small scale things mm -hmm. that made it evident in the 1960s when so many left wing thinkers around. There was a kind of atmosphere for it, and that I think got critics and artists for it, writing things. Now, whether you think it's a good idea for artists to write things is, <laughs> is one question, but it may affect the value of things. You know, so um, none of it is squeaky clean, I think, and there are an immense number of fakes around. Um, so that's just a, a mess, really. But um, I think that's one sign of this change of value. You know, the Kostakis collection was very famous, of and much and all kinds of people. Uh, but it was because he was um, a Greek gopher, really, a man who worked for the Canadian embassy in Moscow. He, would, he was the reliable man who used to collect people from the airport, diplomats and so on. And as he wasn't Russian, he was sort of Greek-Canadian, um, he, was, uh, he was able to collect works and established this enormous collection in his studio. And when he retired, it was one of those um, things in the dam arrangements. When he retired, um, the Ministry of Culture, some of the Ministry of Culture said, you can't take them. Now, until that point, they'd be denying they existed or were describing them as rubbish. <laughs> but they had to say something there. And in the end, a deal was done that Kostakis kept half of it. And they got a lot of transplanted things from the Tritogor country. But then there was one of these cracks of opening up um, the, the system. Uh, I went to, I'll just say one last thing. Um, John Bolt became very celebrated story of that Russian art, WLT, with maybe 50, 60 books and so all good and reliable. He started this fascination when he was a student in Moscow in the 60s. Very primitive circumstances, but for some reason he never found out he was allowed into the picture store of the Tritty Art Gallery. It was a revelation because from the outside there was the Latter-day Stalinist figurative art. Ah, we only have to go through the door into the store. There's all these geometric <laughs> Kandinsky's and all the rest of the world. So it's sort of alternative Russia just waiting to come out again. But whether that really fits in, you know, the, there's been this extraordinary business of shifting the Russian Amazon into Western concept of modern art, shall we call it. Um, Almost to the day after the death of Mylovich in 1935, um, the Museum of Art in New York bought one of his white on white paintings in 1935. Lots of white on white paintings have been done since then. But that was fascinating to me because it was the, the Russians were quite keen not to show his work, um, and they thought it was mystical and nonsensical. We raised the question of what was it about 1918, which was when they were painted, that made it possible, or what did it mean then? But 1935, the Museum of Modern Art bought one <laughs> and put it in their exhibition of Cubism and Abstract Art. The Russian Avon had entered this story of the on the story of modern art at that time. And all its ideological dimension was stripped away. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. <laughs>
talking too much. <laughs> no, no I, I was, I was going to say that another difference between boots and paintings is that yeah. people don't collect boots. Oh, well, I think Theresa May is. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but was Rodchenko paid a salary for his labor? Uh, yes, he worked for this art school. Cool. Well, then and when he, he worked work for um, various magazines, books design, lots of book designs, and uh, so on. But it's just money he had from them. Yeah, which makes him a worker. Oh, yes, it makes him a worker. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's true. But uh, he didn't get very dirty at this time. He very nearly went to, well, he did go to the White Sea Canal project, which was a real slave labor uh, undertaking, a colossal undertaking in the ice and the snow up beyond Mormas somewhere. And um, I, he did a whole lot of photographs of it. And some people think that that was the deal. He was getting there anyway <laughs> with the prison transport. And um, he managed to do a lot of photographs for USSR in construction, well, Margaret's magazine. But I think there were a lot of photographs of prison guards in some way that we've seen yet. So it's a tricky life, really. Uh, yes? Um, how successful was the show, the Roger Coach show in the 70s? Oh, well, you probably, I think it really traveled to be itself. It traveled to a lot of places. Um, it coincided, if this is a straight answer, really, it coincided with minimalism, the mm -hmm. um, Western kind, um, and even in the Rochenko pop up that showed the Tate, uh, seeing those three red, yellow, blue canvases by Rochenko on a white wall tended straight back into all kinds of other artists who then make them decline. Some, but it really was some um, 20, 30, 40 years earlier. Not that it's a race. Uh, but I think the show, the, the figures were quite high, I think, actually. I mean, they don't touch them. We're not going to about them, figures over time, but we're not. I think some of yes. the records of how many people attended, I don't know how well they were kept. Here. Yeah, the subjects so always had um, uh, comment books. They're rather head of the game, what does it have? Comment book saying I don't understand it, it's kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the usual welcome comments to yes. the photos. Yes, but they're going to say everyone, they're going to get to them in the comments. Yeah. So the show was well received? Yes. But, yes. but why was it well received? Um, that is a very simple, devastating question, isn't it? Why was it well received? I think the audience was ready for it. And that might have had something to do with uh, 1968 in Paris, and um, the East-West negotiations have been on and off all the time. Um, Was it unusual to have a show in the West of Russian art? Oh, that kind of Russian art. It was, yes. Since Getting the 1930s. Mm. There was um, Venice Biennale in 1930. 32, uh, the Soviet Republic didn't know for months because they were waiting for instructions for what to hang on the wall. Uh, you know, and they, um, we tried to put on a Monikovsky show two years ago. Yes, but it fell down. I know, I, I wish I had uh, been able to do something about it. Right, yeah, okay, it was great. Yes. It fell down because we couldn't get the people in Russia to release the work. Yes. The price kept going up. Yes, yes. Quite the obstacles have been put in the way. Yes, yes. yes. No, it's, it's got its end removed. It's, it's, it's financially. We won't be pleased today. It has quite a mythology. It's a bit less show than ever. A bit like Philon, if you know the painter. Philon was given that one man shed by the Russian Museum. But that has a frustration. <laughs> my Gorsky show might be possible now. Quite a reasonable director. I think these things are a little bit more Yes. I think that's a great idea still, but maybe this time it's not quite yet. Um, Grad Gallery is worth mentioning. It's worth going to Grad Gallery because they do borrow things from the Treasure Belt and the Russian Museum and some other places. So it's a bit like a little show that they can use in London. But it's some, as a show called Superwoman, I think. Um, 
and the subtitle is um, Work, Build, Don't Wine. Men and women were equally uh, important, which of course means that the women must do hard work, but both kinds of hard labor. Like today. A bit like today, yes. Uh, but there were famous for eating roads and the metro and the sound. There were very strong um, women doing that who rejoiced in being. Um, well, as you explained it to me earlier when we were chatting just before, in Russia, women have had the vote since 1890. Yes, they did to keep their own money. So there were, there was a whole suite of maybe six uh, women gallery directors, gallerists as it were, who became very successful. And, um, the which now was one of them. She put on the famous money which show zero ten people and so on. Uh, but there's a group of them split between uh, Oscar and uh Petrograd and um and they were sort of not more to know about that. Okay. And my Oscar is a great show, yes. I think you shouldn't let it go for us wait for the moment. He was involved in nearly everything, wasn't he? Quite extraordinary. I mean, poetry and books and theatre and sound and theatre. It's a wonderful place to ask him, isn't it? Yes. Um, this Labrenta person has not been able to be a same Labrenta on a line of each and sort of one piece swimming costume or off. He did have a name for that, who did have a name for Anyway, he had a trick that some people can do, um, not many people can do. He became the common man, the voice of the common man, very noisy, loud voice, and almost everything he did was about himself, was it not? You know, Mayakovsky and tragedy played by Mayakovsky, and, <laughs> and they were lips, as you remember, and you know, quite extraordinary. Things were wonderful names, and in trousers. So where do the Russians today see Borchenko? Like, he well, they have one of the things that's happened after the collapse of the communist system was the invention of the museum of private collection, which is a branch of the uh, Pushkin Museum. So there's lots of Russian in there. And they, um, they induced people to lend their collections to it. So you almost book in for some amount of time, I guess you pay for it probably. And quite often they get some of the paintings for keeps afterwards. Uh, but the, the um, collectors rather compete with each other. And they're found to be, you know, okay, but I've got their collection far. But uh, Labrenta has given quite a few things to the Museum of Private Collections. Yeah. And they're an extraordinary idea. You know, the only comment, why do you think of the Museum of Private Collections? Well, my Kowski Museum is a new director. She looks pretty lively to me. And it's uh, around the same time. So, you know, and, uh, and they're demolishing a kind of fascinating setup they used to have in my Kowski Museum. So it really didn't mind, you know? Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> and the, the, the old Soviet ladies have gone, he used to get hold of the scouts of some of my students and say, take this place. Pull them down. Just all the way. Yes. Behave So the French Revolution was big on museums. Yes. The Russian Revolution was not. Oh, it was. They, they opened, I think, 67 museums of the Bob Lamb. Hmm. 1921, 22. They only ever got, you know, some of what works in them before the whole setup was changed. But um, Roger and was. Deputy Director or Director of the Museum's Bureau. All private collections were involved and were nationalised with the word they used, uh, Stukin and so on. There's a big Stukin exhibition coming up actually. He was this you know, famous uh, international um, businessman who 
involved in that. He was Matisse's main source of impact before Zorkelman. Sort of and uh, in Manus' collection, I sort of Picasso and Matisse, you can see things in Moscow, because he opened to artists on Saturdays. He couldn't see in Paris at the time. But, uh, the Russian exhibition at the Royal Academy had yes. lots of these kind of things. It's true, yes, yes. It was yes, and a descendant was around too. Uh, I heard him speaking on the radio. I said, How do you feel about seeing these paintings in London? <laughs> One tour on your father or your grandfather. Wonderful scene, he said, so good. Oh, okay. Our paintings, he said. And so far as you were thinking of playing them, our paintings were terrific in the world. <laughs> <laughs> they just took things. There was something Gorky was in charge of called the art dump. Mm -hmm. They just took things, and that's it. Sometimes, as was Chukin, they gave the yeah, owner uh, um, a job as curator. But I was treating it in my yeah. It's a fact you know, um, they had such a terrific effect on this collection. First book on Picasso was in Russian.
There are lots of exhibitions basically, it's very likely. Yeah. And it was very successful commercial time, really, until the war broke out and the Tsar decided to run the war. Yeah. Uh, Kandinsky went back to Russia for these paintings and other things. He, was, he invented something called Inhook, the Art Institute. Um, where he was asked after a couple of years by Rochenko, constructivists, because he was still going about that, the soul, you see, which was mm -hmm. the concept. He played his cards wrong because a lot of people thought he was German, you know, like a German to that man. Um, he was, he'd written this famous book about spiritual in art, who was spiritual. <laughs> he had uh, an apartment block, which in fact Rochenko had taken to living in. Um, which was the source of his daily income, more or less, and that was nationalized. Um, he invented this art institute for theoretical debate, and he was sacked. And um, so he played it all wrong. Yeah. But he was there, and you know, I thought in this exhibition of Yare, when people like Chagall and Kandinsky and some of the famous names turn up, um, that they should put their title. <laughs> on the label of the Commissar of Martin Vitesk or something, just to show that it was a willful act. Um, but all the stuff we've been talking about happens in literature and film, and you get all the same ideological pressures um, on a way. We're all breathing the same air. But so we can talk a lot more about the huge subject. Thank you.